Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Natasha. How are you today? I'm very well, Michael. Thank you very much. It is so good to see you again. <laughs> it's been a long time. <laughs> it has. Did you say in our email correspondence it was seven years ago? 13, I think. 13 years 13. ago. 13. Oh my God. Yeah. You haven't aged one little bit. <laughs> Very kind, very kind. <laughs> Not at all. Uh, well, it's so good to catch up with you. And I'm really looking forward to hearing your story and what's been happening over those past 13 years. And of course, we're going to talk about your book. So I'm going to start with the first question that I ask all my guests. And that is, tell us a little bit about um, your personal history. Your, so where were you born? Uh, have you moved around? Uh, what about your education, uh, your first job, et cetera, et cetera. And then we'll, we'll carry on from there and get to current day and talk about your book and everything else that's going on in your life right now. So over to you, Natasha. Okay. So I was born in Herefordshire and at 18, uh, as, as many people did, I went off to university. Um, and so I, I set off from a, a little village in Herefordshire um, into Cheshire. And I studied in Chester and I went to Chester Law College and I applied for jobs all around the country. So um, I applied for jobs in Wright, um, as far north as Harrogate and as far south as Bath, but I got a job in Cheshire. So I've ended up, uh, the universe kept me in Cheshire and I've now lived in Cheshire for longer than I've lived in Herefordshire. So um, I, I made a life firstly in Chester um, and then I went slightly nearer to Manchester and I now live in South Manchester. So I qualified as a lawyer. Um, I worked in Cheshire as a, as a, a lawyer and I had partnership. I got married. I had my first child, had my second child. Um, and then fast forward to five years ago, I set up my own business. So right. I might have been a partner in a law firm and I set up my own business, The Effective Law Group. So I work as an employment lawyer, um, advisors to businesses predominantly, uh, some individual executives and um, ultimately all issues around staff, which in the last 12 months uh, in lockdown and the, the word furlough, it wasn't something we were familiar with in this country. So no. there's been lots of uh, governmental directions and legislation to grapple with. So that's where uh, I still work as, as an employment lawyer and um, supporting businesses. And um, that's where I am still today. Okay. So I'm going to wind back a tiny little bit. So when you were doing, what, what made you decide to go into law in the first place? So at around age 12, 13, um, and at the moment I'm, I'm, I'm living that age because I have a, a 12, 13 year old. Um, yes. So she's about to hit her 13th birthday. And, and I remember being that age. And as family used to, to would, would ask basically, what would you like to do? Uh, what would you want to do when you grow up? And I'd, I'd had a spate of change in my mind. So I'd had one weekend, I want to be a model. I was never tall enough to be a model. So that was never going to happen. <laughs> the following weekend, uh, what, what do you want to do when you grow up? Um, I want to be a hairdresser. Following weekend or a few weekends later, uh, what do you want to be? A lawyer. Oh, oh, a lawyer. And however I'd collated this impression from the TV, um, from newspapers, my impression was that lawyers helped people. Yeah. So at around 13, I wanted to help people. I had quite a strong drive within me. I wanted to, um, to, to, to have a vocation where I made a difference. Yeah. So I literally, from that day onwards, I, my direction was law and I never wavered from that ever again. That's incredible to get that insight at such a young age. Well, I, I now wryly um, smile because I hmm. used to read um, the Times on a, on a Wednesday, the Times published law reports. Yeah. So if there's been a case um, and I would avidly, as much as, as my peers were, were picking up 
fashion magazines and, and whatever else or horse magazines I was looking to read the times on a Wednesday and read the times law report and mm. anything to do with law I find incredibly interesting so um I've had an appetite for it and, and that appetite um I'm very fortunate I feel very grateful to say um hasn't really mm. wavered and and so when you kind of were in your teens and the education and the subjects that you studied did you then strategically chose the different subjects in order to go into that direction it's interesting because latterly as an adult i've read a lot about uh, the law of attraction and and having um a vision mm. it did not occur to me in my teens that i would not succeed I um, I knew I had to work hard and get decent grades. I knew I had to go to university. I knew I had to go to law college. And I was very fortunate because some, um, some great mentors passed my, my, crossed my path rather. Yes. And the first time I went for, I went for your works experience from school, so maybe age 15 in a solicitor's firm. Yeah. And there are some people you'll never forget. And this particular solicitor said to me, do what you enjoy because you will be good at what you enjoy. So study what you're, you're interested in. Yeah. Law will come at the end, but don't think you have to do law, law, law. And it was mm. a really good piece of advice, which I now give to young people today. So I was interested in psychology yeah. and I was interested in geography. So yeah. I studied both at A level and I did a combined honours, which actually was more hard work. But anyway, that's by mm. the by um, a combined honours in, in human geography and psychology. And I love my degree. I human love geography. It. So how man, how man um, reflects himself in our environment. So right. whether it's architecture, um, whether it's philosophy, so it's a study of humans within their environment. So from oh my god, never heard the, of it. No, in, well, in, I hadn't until I, until because your first, the first year of the degree we we had uh, part physical geography, part human geography. Mm. But my human geography um, lecturer was I, I, I found him fascinating. He spoke of Marxism and he talked of of how man in their environment in the forties, fifties, sixties. You could see it. Um, the, the architecture that was built, um, the big sort of um, office blocks. So um, it was it was absolutely fascinating. So in my final year of my degree, I actually said to my psychology lecturer, I've enjoyed studying it so much. I'm thinking, should I actually um, not go on to study law? Mm. And she said, why? I said, because the opportunity to help people and uh, understanding their minds, it absolutely intrigues me. Yeah. And she said, well, you're too young to, to immediately start to work in psychology. You, you have to get life experience. So mm. why not get life experience as a lawyer and then see where, where you get to? So I continued on my path with law. Right. That's fascinating. That's, I mean, you were at this crossroads, right, for a minute. So you could have gone either way, but just because you have people giving you some advice and you took on board that advice, you chose a particular direction. And it's unusual that young people actually listen to adults about direction, isn't it? Well, indeed. And I suppose I feel very blessed and very grateful that I had I, or, or some inspiring people were sent to me and I, I sensed I should ask and listen. And they had the, they gave me the time. They were happy to sit and chat with me and chat yeah. around it. And I was given the time. So um, I was taught some really important life lessons, um, which not everybody has that opportunity. So I feel no. incredibly lucky the, the people I, I, I had the chance to speak with. Yeah. But also, you took the time to ask the questions. Well, indeed, yes, indeed. As discussions happen with my thirteen-year-old, um, I, I suppose, when it came to my own style of um, of clothes or my own hairstyles, I thought I knew it all. Um, mm. 
but I was acutely aware. I didn't, I didn't come from a family of lawyers. I didn't know the law and I had to learn it. So every opportunity, if I could ask somebody, um, then um, I would politely ask really. And then the more people time gave me and the more gems were that imparted, I think the more I realized this is just as important as studying. Um, if people will impart life stories and offer advice, then then listen, at least take it on board, let them tell their full story and my life will be different to theirs. But um, similar themes can run through two people's lives that have taken complete different opposite directions, can't they? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And when you then took the direction of going into law, was the this is going to university, right, to study law. Yeah. And did you immediately know which direction of law you wanted to go into at that stage? No, because the first solicitor had said to me, don't do a law degree, which immediately meant I had to do a law degree, a postgraduate law degree in a year. So it was an extra year's study. And quite crucially, it was an extra year's expense. So at age 21, I, at the time at West Bank, we didn't have credit cards in those days. You didn't have overdrafts. Um, and I had two part-time jobs to, 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 to live effectively to make my way in the world. Mm. But I took out a 10,000 pound loan. And then at 21, I was so determined I would succeed. It didn't occur to me I would fail. It didn't mm. occur to me I wouldn't get a job where I could pay that money back. At 31, I'm not sure I would have done the same. No. But at 21, I, I was just, I have to um, I have to borrow this money to do this uh, two years study. Um, I will succeed and I will start paying it back when I get my first job. Never, never doubted I wouldn't get my first job. I was just clear. Um, I will find a way no matter what. It's not an option yeah. to not yeah. find a way, um, wow. which the later you get on in life, um, sometimes it's a bit harder to be like that, isn't it? <laughs> definitely yeah because well you know if you've done a psychology degree or if you looked at psychology not degree but the psychology a level or whatever you did psychology a level was it and degree no i did i studied a degree oh, as well yes and degree yeah. sorry yeah. yeah then you know that the frontal lobe of our brain is not fully developed until we until we're 25 which means the executive, which is the frontal lobe, is where all the decision making takes place, but also where we take risks. And at age 21, we'll take more risks than we would yeah. do once we pass 25. Yeah. Because once we're 25 or beyond, I mean, I don't know exactly when science says that your brain's fully developed, but that's supposedly what has been said in the past then you start to, to weigh things up more. Yeah. You start to kind of go, well, what if I didn't get a job and yeah. I couldn't pay it back? Then I'll be living on the street. And if I live on the street, then I'm going to die. Yeah. You know? But that all happens in split seconds. What yeah. generally what we believe today, you know, <laughs> when we're older, yeah. that's what we believe, you know, or if I can't earn money, I can't pay the mortgage, I'll be on the street and then I'll die. Yeah. And nobody wants to go there of course okay so i was a little bit uncertain about your answer in terms of the direction of travel for law so because i'm i never went to university so i don't really understand terminology that much so just explain for me another once more okay so my conversion degree um i had to study seven areas of law Right. And I think it must have been somebody at law college, a lecturer had said, don't get hung up on, on what you want to get a job in. Right. Because we'd come out of a recession. Um, it was the mid 90s. We'd come out of a, a deep recession. You're going to, you're going, there are a lot of um, students wanting, it was called a training contract. Um, a lot want it, very few will get it. Yeah. So don't don't get don't get hung up on what area of law you want a job in. Get your get your training, get your first job and then do the job and see what what you're good at, what you like. 
Yeah. Now I'd always shown an aptitude for being on my feet. Um, I was confident in public speaking. I liked the court environment. So in yeah. the summer holidays, I'd done um, clerking in the, the Crown Court. So where you sit behind the barristers with their wigs and, and you take the notes basically for the file. And I yeah. loved it absolutely loved that um, I enjoyed it so much there was no responsibility but you were listening to these stories unfold um, in the courtroom and you had sort of the excitement of the courtroom um, and that made me really very happy so criminal yes. law is an interesting area of law so yeah. um, when I so I did my first conversion past that and then it was the solicitor's finals where there are some aspects of law, but they're training you to be a solicitor. You do um, you do a course on advocacy. You do a course on ethics. You do a course on accounts. So all of the skills you need to be a solicitor, um, yeah. it doesn't matter what discipline, they no. train you. So on that particular year, and you do some headliners, um, some business law, some wills and probate, some company law, because some areas of law, some land law, because they're four core areas, they often link into all other areas of law. Yes. So that was tough. That, that, that was a lot of work. Um, and I had sat, I didn't do the employment elective. I wobbled between family law and their unemployment, and I actually chose family. Mm. And interestingly, it was later, a family lawyer said to me, I wouldn't elect to do my area of law ever again mm. because it's very, very draining. You're dealing with people in a very sad emotional state day in, day out. So you have to think about you uh, and what you're going home like at night, which was an yes. interesting comment, actually. So you then, when you, um, if you have your quali academic qualifications as a solicitor, you have two years training. Yeah. where you uh, are paid far less than anybody else in the firm. In fact, the, probably the, the cleaner in the firm is, is paid more than you are. You right. know absolutely nothing. Um, and you're a trainee solicitor and you're there to watch, you're there to listen, and then you're mm -hmm. there to be given a chance. Now, I had the four most amazing mentors um, where, I, where I was offered a, a, a training contract was like a family um and they were in fact the senior partner was the same age as his daughter and then the other three were were, were sort of slightly younger in decades but all yeah. of them youngest partner could have been my big brother um right. the oldest partner could have been my father but each and every one of them gave me their time and over that two-year period when I spoke to my friends in London firms and, and, and in different and sort of different types of firms bigger corporates Mm. I had such a quality training. Um, I was thrown in the deep end. I would literally be given papers and saying, you, you're off to court. The court's down the road, uh, just down the, down the hill, on the left-hand side. Um, <laughs> you'll work it out. And I so often was thrown in the deep end. But I didn't sink and I, I swam. And I had an aptitude. I enjoyed advocacy. So I was doing um, some court hearings and... Um, I liked the court environment. Now, most areas of law, you have to either be paper-based um, yeah. or you're court-based. Yeah. There's one area of law that does both, and that's employment law. Oh, right. So a case came into the firm um, in the days of legal aid, and nobody in the firm did actually employment law, and we just had the biggest new piece of legislation um, for decades called the Employment Rights Act in 1996. So absolutely every lawyer was coming to terms with the Employment Rights Act. It was new. We didn't have employment lawyers in, in the mid nineties, but yeah. the, the raft of legislation took us from archaic 1960s, 70s legislation um, to 1996. So it was a good time to get started as an employment lawyer because it was a, it was a level playing field in respect of um, everybody was learning this new piece of legislation. So yeah. I did my first case, which was amazing. Um, that in itself was a great story. It was, it was a little man against Tesco's and we won. Yeah. Um, and, it, and, and that was my first, I've just changed somebody's life and all odds were against us because Tesco's was a big conglomerate. We were just a yeah. little person. 
we were repeatedly told by Tesco's lawyers we couldn't possibly win, but I believe my client. And yeah. um, when we got to tribunal, the judge believed my client. So yeah. then I thought, this is what I want to do. So whilst right. I was training, I'd been doing um, some property, I'd been doing some wills and some sort of commercial law under the guidance of, of, of my, uh, and some family law. Yeah. But then I said to, to my, to, to who then became my partners, I want to set up an employment law department. Can I go out and get employment work in? And can I start? Um, and in, uh, nobody in the locality was doing employment law. So I so said, can I, can I try and be the only local employment law expert? And they said, yeah, go for it. Oh. And so I built up the employment law aspect um, and I brought more cases in and got myself known for being um the local expert and work was sent to me. Um, I did networking events like BNI. Um, and I got I got known to being outside of Manchester, the only sort of provincial employment lawyer. Right. Um, and Manchester firms would send me work, actually. Um, if there was a conflict with big firms, they would send the work out yeah. to me. Um, and so that's how my, my employment law career began. Wow. Wow. Th that's... Thank you for that, because that really fills in all the gaps in terms of how you got started in that. And it's interesting when you said employment law does both court and the paperwork side of it. And of course, you so much enjoyed being in the court as well. Um, and I've got quite a, um, uh, a lot of respect for employment lawyers because i went through a tribunal with a past employer myself and they threw everything at me yeah and very bizarrely where i lived at the time what what was really lucky at the time i had in my contents insurance insurance for court cases for legal aid Right. So I was able to go to a top company in Birmingham um, who my past partner knew because she she worked in human resources yeah. at the time. And um, they then took on the case, but they then appointed a barrister also yeah. to get involved. And that barrister where I lived at the time, he was my neighbour. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Through really, I just wanted to share that story. He was my neighbour. He lived next door to me. Wow. And um, it was the most bizarrest thing. Now, we won the case before we even walked into the courtroom. Wow. Because the company knocked on the door and said, we want to do a deal. Yeah. And we did the deal. We still went into the court. And so my my ex employer had to explain what happened just before we went into court. And he basically said, well, in that case, get out and sort it out between you. Yeah. Why are you wasting my time in here? So which is, I mean, it was a good outcome for me, obviously. Yeah. But I, it took a good 12 months before we yeah. got to court. Yeah. And the fear I was under in that yeah. period of time, the stress, you know, the loss of money and all of that. Yeah. And yeah, so I have I have great affinity <laughs> with it, with employment law. Um, and then a, a family member at the moment is going through similar cases at the moment as well, which is, you know, it's horrible. It's horrible. It's very, being in litigation, and I say this to clients, that uh, it's not like it is on TV. Very rarely does anybody come out winning um, yeah. because there's been collateral damage. So you might yeah. on pay, you might be paid some money, but um, somebody losing their job can lose their identity, especially if yes. they've been, if they've been um, institutionalised, if they've worked somewhere for 20 years and they've, mm. they've worked with the same people and they haven't, they haven't moved around. And you pull the rug from under somebody in those scenarios, they go through a grieving process. Um, and I 100%. began to realize that if I was intrigued with psychology, what made people tick, then my area of law listens to people's stories. 
So um, every single case is between, it ends up between two people, between yes. an individual in the company and then the claimant, and it's their story. So I begin to seek the truth, really. Mm. Um, I try to understand the personalities. I try to understand, okay, well, why has this happened? Bullying, for example, is very complex because most individuals don't intend to go out and make somebody's life misery. They're projecting onto somebody else something that's going on in their own life, basically. Yeah. So, and on, on it goes, basically. So I've listened over the years just to so many stories and I can't remember every client by name. No. But I can remember most stories because like, I suppose I explained at the beginning, I do take the time to get to know my client, to, yeah. to understand all the facts. I ask a lot of questions and I say, look, bear with me. You probably don't think this is relevant. But I need to know all of the details for me to piece this together, because if I can understand most of the jigsaw, I can then decide what's the best way to progress this. Mm. And some clients, I advise litigation is not the best thing for you, because if you're anxious now and you're stressed now and you're not sleeping now, believe Mm. me, sat on your shoulder, this heavy burden and this fear you won't move on with your life, your, your yeah. future, what's important. So shall we see if we can find a different solution to this, um, which enables you to move on with your life quicker, really? So yeah. that wasn't how I thought it would be in my 20s, but that's in the end how I became known as a lawyer and, and clients referred me to friends and family and said, look, lose use Natasha she's not your, your, your usual lawyer really so mm. um it's really important to me that I know all of the details because then I feel I can do my job well so um it's yeah. sort of how I, I I had an impression how a job in a suit um was to be performed but over the years I found my way of doing it yeah. and probably it was, it was quite it was quite a significant time actually probably around 20 2010 I pretty much stopped wearing a suit I said I'm not your normal lawyer I'll be honest with you now I don't always think fighting is the best way um so I don't look like your normal lawyer Uh, we've all studied the same law but if it's a fighter you want I'm probably not your person you're probably better to go to a big firm who who's fighting is their thing so occasionally I get my suit out. It's been a very long time, it feels, with lockdown um, since I've put a suit on. Um, yes. But I just sort of that armour, that, you know, that sort of bravado. Around 2010, I, I said, it's not who I am. I'm a no. mother with two young children. I think I do a really good job, um, but I do it slightly differently to others. Yeah, and I guess we'll get on to this in a minute, but I guess because you studied psychology because you're interested in helping people you've got more of the kind of people side qualities in the way that you give people advice so when you're interested in learning about people's story on both sides you know you're you're really trying to get under the skin of really what it is that's going on um rather than just saying oh yeah Here's somebody who's aggrieved with their employer. Yeah, I'll take on the case. Whether they win or lose, it doesn't really matter. I'll still get paid. Yeah, and so somebody has been made redundant to show some compassion. Um, Mm. If even legally on on paper it stacks up, to show them some compassion, some understanding, um, that um, and allow them to talk and and just to 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 really let it go you know that they're aggrieved that they they've they've been cast aside why them why not their colleague and what are they going to do because they're so they're often in a point of fear and they need to hear it from somebody you will find another job now it might be not the same job that you've been doing because it might be uh and i'm I'm perhaps more spiritual and philosophical these days it might be the universe has a different plan yeah so, so if you're looking to go exactly what you've just done, that may not happen. But if you if no. you are open to learning new skills, if you're open to applying for jobs you wouldn't normally apply for, then I promise you 99% of my clients a year later have come back to me and said, Natasha, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Exactly. Because yeah. I went on to study this, I went on to try that, and I'm now doing a job nothing like I was made redundant from. But had I have not been forced to make the change, had there not been the catalyst to force me to change, I wouldn't have done it. 
So it was pretty hairy for a couple of months and and the fear of having no money coming in is awful. Um, But sometimes we get sent in a different direction in life, don't we? 100%, 100%. Okay, so so when you were in that partnership, you became a partner. So what made you decide to leave them and start your own business? How did that come about? So I was partners in two firms. The first firm was because I had two young children and the 2008 recession had bit um, and my life was a bit chaotic. Um, So I made some, I was trying to find a work-life balance. I didn't have work-life balance. And so my first partnership I left, I had a nine-month-old baby, uh, a three-year-old, um, I had a supportive husband, so financially, um, he was the main wage earner. Um, yeah. And so I realized my children needed me and they needed me um, in a good place, not me burnt out, not me walking through the door exhausted or stressed. Um, yeah. So my first partnership I came out of and I I set up a business called Cheshire Employment Law um, and I kept my professional qualification, kept my toe in the water um and I was full-time a mum um and I was part-time um acting for for clients clients who had found me out um I acted for but I didn't necessarily promote the business or or effectively at that time I was careful to bring too much of a workload back into my life got it through doing that business, I was asked to help set up a law firm um, in South Manchester. So because I worked for myself and because I set up my business, I'd shown a skill set. Yeah. Um, and somebody um, somebody crossed my path who um, managed a firm in Oxford and they wanted to come up to the Northwest. And my comment to him was, um, um, my children have very, uh, bring my children up are really important to me. Um, I spend quite a lot of time in France um yes I run my own business um but um I work the hours around my family so I'm not really sure you're the right person for the job and he said that's exactly why you're the right person for the job because if you've done all of this um with going to France with basically bringing up your children then this is a skill set I'm looking for so right. we we began um, in 2012. Uh, I began an exciting journey, um, and we set up um, the office. And fast forward, then in four years later, the business was sold. Right now, at that point, I was in a very different personal situation. Um, I was no longer married. Um, It was myself and my children. Um, We were living um, near to the office that I'd worked in, near to the school. Um, And when the business was sold, I I saw it again. Um, There was the fear of change. Um, They were going to be moving the office and everything was going to be changed. But I saw it as the opportunity. Well, I have worked for myself before. Yeah. I can do this. And this time... um, I will, I will present it in a different way. So I, I saw that HR businesses that offered um, companies fixed fees um, were, had infiltrated the um, marketplace. When I was getting divorced, I didn't like the hourly charge. It worried me. Um, I needed to speak to my lawyer, but every minute it cost me more money. That caused me uh, fear already a fearful time. Um, so I set up a business which said, I will work on a fixed fee. You'll get a 20 years experience employment lawyer, um, but I will quote for the job. Just as right. if I my car fixed, I want to know how much it's going to cost before they do it. Um, yeah. just as, so so I, I became a different employment lawyer again, both right. in the style I practiced employment law, but also I worked on a fixed fee. And so wow. clients like that, they, they like yeah. the surety of having me at the other end of the phone, but knowing what it cost every month. So yeah. I went into a diff, came out of my comfort zone and went into a different arena, as it were. And that's what you're in now. So I still have the effective law group in the right. last two years since summer 2019. I've had a real drive for well-being in the workplace. Right. Um, it's been on my radar that when people are struggling in their personal life, they're taking it to work. And so 
my 20 years worth of stories uh, of people, a lot of the people who I acted for were struggling. So mm. the people who were being exited from their job, the job was the last thing to go, to be honest. There was always, a, there was already a lot of, um, and so they were unsettled before they lost yes. their job very often. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I began to put the jigsaw together in with different pieces. And I'd had a, a spate of clients who had been made redundant and had really, really struggled, but were suffering alone. And they'd shared with me and I'd, I'd started to talk to them about well-being and looking after themselves and said, look, use this time when you're either on garden leave or you're looking for another job to do the exercise you've never had time to do because you work such long hours to yeah. whatever it may be, this is an opportunity. And the more I, I began to work with people with well-being and self-care, mm. the more great feedback I got and the more my interest grew, um, it, it, what I suppose it, it extended. There was an extension yes. of, if I'd always just been reading law books, I started reading around the subject and then had been for a while interested um, in, in, in self-help and, and mental well-being and, and yes. what we can do to help ourselves. Okay. So what was the, what was the catalyst for that? So what, what really, was it just, why did you start speaking to people about well-being? So a few clients had c commented, I've now gone on to do this, this and this, and that was, um, but I'm doing something different. But mm. they'd said, Natasha, I don't know if you ever realized, but those chats you had with me where you'd listened and, and I'd, I suppose I'd opened up. I don't know whether you realized how much it meant to me, how much I was really struggling and how much it saved me. And right. I had a spate of clients telling me that. And then very close to me, somebody was made redundant. And I got to see what being made redundant was like from yeah. the inside right and i got to watch the person just fall apart i got to see how without their identity working for a, a big corporate they felt they were nothing yeah and yeah. the person i watched them effectively have a breakdown yeah and from that moment onwards i knew that never again could i probably partake in a redundancy process acting for a company without yeah. understanding that the person who would always be nameless, suddenly I knew what was being inflicted upon the person. Yeah. So it were in current times for businesses to survive, businesses have to be streamlined. Mm. It is an unfortunate part of the world. Yeah. But if a business can support those people they're exiting, if a business can understand there's a more compassionate way to exit somebody rather than to tear them apart and criticize their performance, yeah. then you can send somebody out in the world in a slightly better way. Yeah. So it was getting to see it inside out. Um, and personally around me, a few things were happening. And I probably, I sat quietly myself. I reflected and said, well, if I'm going to give out this advice, I need to talk not just talk it, I need to walk the walk. Um, and I began to reflect um, that maybe I hadn't looked after myself quite as well as I had done. Mm. That in the past, when I'd seen somebody struggling, I had poured everything I had into that person to help them, yeah. um, leaving my cup empty. So yeah. I began to see the, the, the best role model I could be for my children was to show them, you fill your own cup up you look after yourself, you feed yourself well. And then when your cup overflows, you can help other people. Yes. But what I'd previously done is I'd given everything and left my own cup empty in helping others. Yeah. Um, so my children were quite, I felt, uh, they were an age where they were, they were no longer just little, where they just obediently went and did everything because mummy said so. They yeah. were starting to ask questions and, and we were having family discussions over supper. So um, part of it was, was it me trying to be a 
the best mum I could to my children? Was it me doing it for my clients? I, probably a bit of both. Mm. But once I started avidly using the word self-care program and once people started saying, oh, my word, Natasha, after a week, I feel so different. After a month, this has made so much difference. I was really on my knees. Then it gained momentum, really. Right. Um, and it was gaining momentum. And then we had lockdown. Right. So I'd had this momentum of helping people. And I'd ask more questions. I checked in with more people. Are you OK? And I'd started, um, I'd quieted my life down and I started observing a lot more and I started listening a bit more too. Yes. Yeah. Fascinating, isn't it? Um, it's when we, when we take the time to not just observe ourselves, but observe others and see you know, the Buddhists call it the suffering. Yeah. And everybody's entitled to their suffering. Right. Yeah. So we, we can't take that away from people. And often they have to go through a period of suffering to come out the other end. And you're not human if you haven't been through suffering. Everyone yeah. has a story of suffering in their lives. Everyone has a story. And so the fact that you were you're starting to recognize that more and more in people and also having recognized that in yourself you're you're better placed to support people yeah. in their times of suffering um to help them uncover some strategies that they could use to you know improve it improve you know move towards happiness a bit more yeah uh, but it yeah it, it's it's I mean, not only is it difficult times now, right now, it's everyone's going through yeah. an element of suffering. You know, I was on a on a Zoom call this morning with about twenty people in the creative arts industry, and they're all on their knees. Yeah, you know, I bet. And they're they're all mega mega depressed. <laughs> And they're all like going, oh, what's Boris is going to say on Monday? We can't wait to hear. I bet it's bad news, you know. And I, I try to help them to reframe it a little bit <laughs> by saying, you know, ex expect the worst so you won't be disappointed, um, which I know doesn't sound helpful. But actually, if you get bad news, don't be disappointed because it's just news, you know. So how, so what happened next then? You're in lockdown, you're kind of observing people, you may be helping some people and friends and family. And then you took pen to paper, I believe. <laughs> so I, I'd almost put myself on a pre-lockdown lockdown. So autumn, winter 2019, hmm. I decided I needed to be quiet. Um, I, I um, wanted to really give meditation a good go um, and that was bringing up lots of stuff and I was journaling lots and so I decided to it was we were getting ready for winter I was going to bed down for winter and I was going to spend some time with myself and so when we came into lockdown I'd mm. been locked down since since November October November um, 2019 Yes. So I was used to not going out and about. I was used to not seeing people. Um, I, you know, I had really been tucked away. Yeah. And so I approached lockdown with only on, on the Buddhist um, suffering and, and happiness. Um, I had to look within me. Um, I had to frame um, how I was going to deal with every day. Um, and I found by having certain routines, um, my days were far happier than if I had, if I, if I, if I did some things or didn't do some things effectively. So yes. I started tweaking and messing around with, um, and my, my recollection is, and, and I'm extremely grateful for it, is that I had COVID the week before lockdown. 
Right. And I don't know whether because I had COVID, I didn't have the fear of COVID that many had. Yes. Um, because my body had been through it and I and I'd felt it pass through my body. Um, and I, I'd sort of lay back in the water and let it be. And then we went into a national lockdown. Um, mm. And so I saw it as an ex- the extension of what I'd started in um, autumn 2019. I saw it as just an enforced continuance. Right. And so I actually did quite a few um, Buddhist online um, weekend sort of retreats. Um, right. And I really learned about the extent of suffering and, and, and it, suffering is perception. And we're all in control of what we perceive. And the more I delved into these teachings and these readings, and I thought I was journaling for me. And I yeah. bought, I had a new book and I'd, and I'd written, um, I'd, I'd jotted things down. And I, I'd been with some, some, I'd collected some people together just before lockdown. I'd called it a day retreat yeah. um, to, to put people in a room to talk, to go for a walk, to eat healthy food and see what, what the energy did. Um, yeah. And it was a, an amazing day. And somebody made a passing comment on that day. You've got a book in you. And I said, me, a book? No, 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 I don't think so. They said, you have. <laughs> um, meditate on it. Because by then I'd, I was sort of 100 days into my morning meditation. Yeah. So um, as I wrote, wrote down in lockdown, as I read, and I think that's a really good point, and I jot it down. And then I sort of had this book where it was all collected together. Um, and then I suppose the person telling me, you you do have a book in, in you, and thinking, okay. And then I was, Ron, who has illustrated my book, I was talking to him about it. And he, he'd he um, not long previously had a heart attack. He'd been through some, some sort of physical rehab. And my story about self-care and each of us looking after ourselves had, had struck a chord with him because yeah. he'd had a life-changing experience. Yeah, and he was quite moved. And I threw a castaway comment and said, well, fancy illustrating it Ron if I write this book we'll write the book together and he said I'm retired you know and I said well we've no time scale Ron you know you can draw when you draw and he Mm. said okay so we as I sent sort of uh, I had this this they were sort of around between 30 and 40 they were key words which it now turns out are actually good habits but at the time yeah. I didn't realize that's what they were. And so I'd give him my word and he'd go away and think about it and we'd chat about it and he'd come back with um, with his illustration. And in every illustration, it was the same man. And somewhere along the line with the, the illustrations coming through of the man, hmm. the story, um, it came, I don't know where it came from. It was within me a yes. collection of 20 years worth of listening to other people's stories. So it's a story yeah. about a fictional man and it's not about one particular man, but it's got lots of snippets of yeah. stories of people who've shared with me over the years, because my, my pattern that I saw, if the demographic of who I'd acted for were middle-aged men who were stuck yeah. in life, yeah. And reading around it, we have the highest suicide rate in the UK of males aged between 35, 45 and 49. Right. And I suppose the penny drop in that this is the demographic in this country we have a serious mental health problem with that's not mm. talked about and ends in suicide. I know these these men generally generically because many of these men ended up on my doorstep me acting for them in respect to them being exited from their job because if you are if you're in in that stuck in life at burnout struggling not sleeping you're not performing very well at work no there was no coincidence that these men I was being asked to help to leave um but yet when I did the full circle, what I really wanted to do was help them, 
help themselves because by then I'd understood the Buddhist approach that you can't remove suffering. I can't fix anybody. I can't make anybody's suffering go away. And I look back in, in, in my life and there've been occasions I've tried to remove somebody's suffering. I've tried to make it all okay. And I thought I was helping, but actually somewhat I wonder if the best thing to do is to say, I'm here to support you. If you want any suggestions, by all means ask, this might help, that might help, but this is your journey. This is for you to decide your path because your path will be different to mine. And so the book isn't a, you have to do this, you have to do that. The book is the story of the man and the things he tried. And my, my idea is, is that a person may flick through it. They may look at one picture only they may read it through from back to front they may read it all the way through Mm. but the book has something to offer everybody whether it's somebody who's watching somebody suffering it's Mm. somebody who is burning out because they've reached a point they hit a wall and their current lifestyle the hours they're working the life they're leading they don't have an opportunity to help themselves so until they make some changes until they sit quietly, until they start to, to take some steps, they will be stuck. Yeah. So one person may pick up one picture and one habit. One person might try all 32. There's a variation. There, I feel confident no two people will take the same from the book. Um, and that's, for me, I like variation. My job's always been yes. one of variation. We're not all the same. We didn't no. come in all the same our life experience is not the same and what I do know is in lockdown no two people's lockdown landscape was the same no Uh, people live in the same household have different landscapes and the pandemic has really shown how we are all different and how we all deal with things how we perceive things yes um there's a huge breadth human beings just vary so much and embracing our differences and supporting each other and checking in with each other. Mm. That's what I feel is really, I feel very passionately. That's what life's about. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. What's the book called? The book was called man Yes. It's about <laughs> a man in a pandemic. So yeah. yes, it's a, um, have you got it there? Uh, no, because oh. at the moment, <laughs> It's Amazon have put it on pre-order right. and at first they struggled because every time you, you typed in mandemic, they kept trying to give you pandemic yeah. because, it, because mandemic wasn't a word known to Amazon. No. So there is apparently the, the, um, the, the proof, the real book is on its way to me. Um, yes. And I, that I have this sense that the last few weeks of the book being published and, and people being very supportive and all doing the book, there's been a sense of, is this really happening? <laughs> I've had a book published and I think until this book arrives and I hold it, I don't think I'll really believe it. It's um, not real. Well, I mean, I had this out of body experience when my publisher typesetted it and, and it was sent through to me and it looked on the screen like I was opening a book. And I really had like, for a good 10 minutes, I, I felt I was watching myself looking at this book. Which, Which I you were, that, of course. Well, well indeed, indeed. Um, yeah. Because I know I could probably do an audio of this book in my sleep. I know every single word in the book. I know every page of the book. But seeing the book presented as a book on the screen. Mm. So when uh, there's every chance I'll cry in all honesty, when, when the book I yeah. have here, hold it, I'll be overwhelmed. So, um, yeah, so any day now. That oh, it's only brilliant. To see me. Yes. And are you doing an audio book as well? Well, part of my journey was sitting quietly and sitting still, mm. having no tech and letting the body be as the body. I think Mother Nature, Mother, if we have cavemen and, and they live without any technology and we have our lives massively infiltrated with technology. And days, and I've had actually this week, People have been so kind. I've had so many messages and I've, my tech use has really gone up. Uh, yes. Social media and 
but I'm absolutely exhausted. Um, yeah. Last night, um, the impact on my body of extra tech, um, yeah. I was zapped, absolutely zapped. Um, so I knew, right, okay, what can I do to lift my energy? I need an early night. Um, I need to get some really good food in me. Um, and the next couple of days, I need to take it steady because yes. um, I didn't used to know, didn't used to listen to my body and I would get overwhelmed. Mm. Where last night I was being given the warnings, basically. Okay, yeah. you know, listen. So um, I've lost my train of thought. Yeah, you don't want to use any more tech doing an audio book. So the <laughs> book, I, I firmly want it to be a book people hold. I want yes. them to look at the pages and pause. Mm. and turn a page or keep it on a bedside table or have it in the, somebody's it might be in the loo anywhere but I've, I'm I'm really fighting it going on Kindle um it's a short book it's a it's it's a short fictional story um yes. one male friend said Natasha is it a comic is it a comic if it's got so many pictures and it probably might almost be a comic because if yes, you remember good. as a child you could pick up the thread of what was being said. You could see the baddie, would, the, the hero would come in the room and he'd get in a fight with a baddie and then he'd nearly, nearly, nearly lose, but then the end he'd win. But the yes. pictures told it all. Yeah. So it's a book I want people to hold and I want parents to hold and, and show their children and have a, children on their, a child on their knee. And yeah. so never say never, but it's really the sense of what the book's about as human beings. Sometimes we need to come away from tech and we need to sit in a quiet room or sit in a garden or go to a park and just breathe and be. And my book's a book where I'm urging people to breathe and just be. Yeah. Which is wonderful. Absolutely brilliant. And of course, you know, and you're, children i don't know how they are with tech <laughs> but um the millennials of course that's how they are being with their tech that's how they are able to be and so we also and i'm not saying you've got to um be open to potentially reach a wider demographic by having a Kindle version. Yeah. But even more importantly, I think, is an audio version. And I I personally believe, like we're doing this podcast, okay, we're doing it on both mediums, we're doing video and audio, but the audio part will be listened to more than the video part nowadays. Yeah. I think people are tired of video, yeah. believe it or not. I think video is still massive, but there's, a, there's, there's an element of where people are starting to get tired of video and they want to go back to radio, not almost, you know. And um, this, this, this app come out last year, I only discovered in the past week, called Clubhouse. Yeah. And this is a new social media. Well, is it social media or is it just a, they're calling it like a conference uh, app where people go into mini conferences for an hour or so and they talk about a particular topic and and I've been listening to some of the things that have been, and there's a huge amount going on about you know well-being yeah well-being in the workplace and various other things and so it's fascinating that people are moving towards audio type help <laughs> let's put it that way you know and they are finding they can they don't have to sit down and watch something but they can be quietly listening to something in their ears yeah. and still be on you know on that level so put it in your uh, little notebook for a future yeah. project oh, yeah. yeah yeah but i i th i think what what i love that you've done about the book is that you've put it in a story right and i'm all about storytelling that's yeah. what my business is about that's what this podcast is about and and it makes it more memorable for people 
and it makes it more relatable because what they do is they put themselves in the shoes of the character yeah. and then they go, oh, he is actually like me. <laughs> you know, yeah. I can see myself in there. And, and another little bit of, I mean, you've totally pitched it right because when I was 44, maybe I was a year early, but that's when my midlife crisis struck, Yeah, you know, bang on time. And that's when I had to rediscover myself. And that's when I discovered Tony Robbins and Wayne Dyer, which we've kind of chatted on, yep. messaged each other on, and other teachers, you know, in other realms and the angelic realm and, you know, meditation, not so much in the beginning anyway, then. Um, more so now, you know, that I'm absorbing more content in that field and learning huge amount, uh, like you are. Yeah. So fascinating. I've been doing a lot of talking for the last few minutes. So, um, what, what are you hoping in terms of what you might, if you had like your wish with this book, who are you specifically hoping will pick up the book and get something from it i suppose anybody what i hope it reaches people who are struggling so whether it's become talked about have you read that book mandemic have you heard of that what's that mandemic i've heard about that's somebody who was really struggling mm. who would never reach out for a self-help book would never perhaps ask for help go for counseling yeah it might make its way um, to somebody who has got to the point they think life's not worth living yes, and they think, well, might as well give it a go. And by maybe going out for a morning walk, looking at an, an evening routine and some of the, the habits, all of the habits are free. You don't need any equipment to do them. Anybody no. can give any of the habits a go at any point. And that one or more of the habits helps somebody go from thinking life isn't worth living and everything's pointless to giving them a glimmer of hope. So I'm not a PT, I'm not a nutritionist, I'm not a psychologist. All I hope is that somebody gets on whatever path is right for them. Mm. If they're on a path which makes them unhappy and they are suffering a lot, that they have some moment of inspiration to step onto a, a slightly different path. And it might be mm. their little finger or their little toe, but anything just to, if you do what you've always done, you will get what you've always got. And this demographic of, of middle-aged men that I've, I've acted for, many of them are resistant to anything new. They're resistant to any change because they are just full of fear. So yeah. the only way they know how to cope is just that, just stay where I am. Um, and go so, in a cave. Indeed, yeah, indeed. But you can't take somebody suffering from them. Um, the person's got to want to help themselves. Yes. So I just hope the story finds its way to people, however it finds its way, whether it's Christmas presents, Easter presents, birthday presents, somebody just sees it and says, well, what's that about? Yeah. The title of the book, Mandemic, and it, it's a tale of a man who didn't like to be told what to do. Yeah. And so I am just hope it catches the eye of these people that are struggling. And I have this awful, awful feeling that we will, we will not properly know the extent that people have been suffering alone in the pandemic for some time yet. Until we start to lift the lid, it will take a couple of years. There, have been, there will be some people who were so isolated. If you, if you suffer from depression, you naturally isolate yourself anyway. But these people haven't had other people with eyes on they've not been in the workplace where somebody ch checks in with them so yeah. it, it needs everybody else in humanity to go up another step to check in with people if they've not heard from somebody just wonder how they are just let the person know I'm here for you are you okay um, and you may not get an answer but what we can do as human beings is we can look out for each other can't we we can give each other some something back yeah wonderful thank you very very interesting and thank you for writing the book thank and you. i'm sure 
in time we will hear lots of stories about how you know individuals male or female will have got something from that and um, turned their lives around as a consequence oh by the way you said something a few seconds ago which was i'm not a psychologist i'm not a pt i'm not this i'm not that but what you have done is you've lived some of those things yourself too you've been through suffering yeah in your life you have seen it firsthand and you've experienced it not just observed other people but you've also experienced it i have i have yeah and that i think is important for people to know so you're not you're talking with the voice of experience life experience as well yeah and all of these things i tried because i was suffering mm. And I thought, well, I might as well try anything in all honesty. Yes. And because I was within the Buddhist teachings, I was seeing this is down to me. There's, this isn't, there isn't any one person I should be looking to to make me happy. This is all about me and my inner environment. So yes. every single one of those habits, I tried myself and they made a difference to me. Now I appreciate I'm a female, but then as I recommended them to men who were struggling in a self-care program and actually some women, and then they said, Natasha, it's made such a difference. That was perhaps the lightning, sort of the, the light bulb moment when I realized maybe it isn't just me this could work for. Yeah. So I started sharing with people and said, we'll try this and try that. And then as more and more people have tried it and have, have fed back to me, yes, it has made a difference. Yeah. That's how it sort of has gained momentum. So all of those 32 habits, I personally have used and do use. Fantastic. So what last question I have, <laughs> um, well, there's a couple of questions. There's three more questions. Sorry, not last question. Well, the first one is when, when, I mean, who knows when we'll come out of this pandemic? Probably never. <laughs> um, but what what is your business going to look like going forward? What 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 does it contain? So if somebody was to pick up the phone to you, can you help me with what would it be? I think well being in the workplace when right. we go into a new the workplace is going to change yes um a hybrid i think of part working from home and part people meeting in in a hub but um i've done some zoom sort of um talks really um about sharing some ideas and, and collaborating with people about working in the best possible way so the best way, whether your workplace is within your home or whether your workplace is somewhere else. I see this picture that if we have people in the UK are working in happy, healthy workplaces, that's got to have a knock on for society, hasn't it? For yes. our children. Um, so that's my am ambition. That's what I hope for. That yeah. um, when we we ease out of this um lockdown this pandemic we don't go back to how we used to do things in yes. respect of work-life balance uh, we think it through we talk about it we try different things and I would love to be part of those initiatives um, yeah. both as an employment lawyer uh, duty of health and safety care at work but from a humane compassionate point of view then it seems a way, I can't remove everybody's suffering, but it seems a way, if you focus on the workplace, to help a lot of people. Yeah. And are you still going to be doing employment law as well? Um, I think I, I think my future's an open book. Um, right. As my children need me less and less, um, I'd love to travel. Um, yeah. My book's gone all around the world, effectively. Um 
if my future was talking about things I talk about in the book um, and that's how I spend sort of um, the next decade, I'd be delighted because it doesn't feel like work. Um, yeah. Who knows, really? Um, I think I will be pointed in the direction I'm supposed to go and I'll give it my, my best go. Brilliant. Brilliant. So if people wanted to get in touch with you to learn more about well-being at work, let's put it that way, how can they get in touch with you? What's the best way? So um, I post lots on LinkedIn. So Natasha Jones on LinkedIn. Um, I have a website and my um, email is natasha at effectivelaw.co.uk. So I'd email me direct, um, have a look at uh, me on LinkedIn, what I post, um, what effectively my online CV. Um, yeah. I run a closed community, um, which is male only, um, called Mandemic. So we have a Facebook group called Mandemic. So any guys out there who want to come within the group and, and listen to some of the lives I do. Um, and Mandemic book is on Instagram as well. So, um, Mandemic book on Instagram. Mandemic so, book and then Mandemic, the private Facebook group. Yes. Yeah. So they can just request to join. I yes. Think Indeed. Yeah. Yes. Perfect. And are there some questions they need to answer or? They, um, in just... the Mandemic, to, to have act to come into the private group, there are a few questions. Yeah. Um, so, nothing, um, nothing you need to be a rocket scientist to answer. Perfect. Perfect. My very last question is, um, is there anything that I haven't asked that you wanted to share with our listeners today? I don't think so. I think we've had a really good chat. Um, so no, um, I, I think we've covered uh, a huge, a huge, uh, a huge breadth of time. <laughs> I know we could talk about the topic of you know, well-being and Buddhism and meditation and lots of other things for for quite a long time. Um, but um, I've really enjoyed chatting with you and thank you for getting me up to date. I hope it's not going to be 13 years before I see you next. Not uh, <laughs> so um, whenever it's time that we can are allowed to go to lunch with people again, and if you're ever in the Midlands again, uh, please let me know and I'll buy you lunch and uh, be really good to see you in person. Natasha, thank you so much for your time and um, hope we speak very soon in the future. And I look forward to seeing how your book goes. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Good luck with that. Bye for now. Bye bye. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe and share at will. I'm always looking for more listeners and guests, so do get in touch, please. You can find me pretty easily by searching for Staying Alive UK. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.